Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. And uh, <laughs> thank you for um, your wonderful comments in the chat about the hold music. Uh, I selected it myself, so I'm personally uh, very appreciative uh, that, that some of you enjoyed uh, Beethoven as we waited to begin today. My name is Jason Belland, and I'm with Columbia Business School Executive Education. I'll be your host today. And I thank you so much for taking the time to be with us Today, we've got a great session ahead of us inside the box uh, with my colleague, Jacob Goldenberg, who's joining us. You can see him on the screen as well. Before we get started, uh, I do want to uh, encourage you to participate. We have a nice group of folks with us today, a very international audience, some folks who are brand new to Columbia Business School, some who are alumni of the school, others who are with us on our LinkedIn group who are continuing to participate in conversations. So. We thank all of you for being here, and I do want to encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. So you can do that using the chat window. Um, I'll, right now I'm going to enter a link to our LinkedIn group so you can access that. Um, so if you ask questions throughout the presentation, I'll moderate those questions, and we'll have time for plenty of Q&A toward the end. So um, please feel free to use, use the chat as you see fit. And uh, before we get started, I do want to tell you uh, this session that we're about to engage in uh, for the next half hour is really part of uh, a great program that we have called Marketing Innovation. Jacob Goldenberg is a big part of that program. Um, that's coming up. We've got two sessions, one June 17th through 19th here in New York, and another one uh, here at the Columbia campus in New York in November. Uh, it's a really great program. It's a pretty new program. We've run it a few times, and uh, we're really excited about it. So um, I hope that this session inspires you to think differently and ask questions, and then uh, if you're interested in the program, we'll be happy to take you on that journey as well. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to you, uh, my colleague, uh, Jacob Goldenberg. Uh, sir, thank you so much for being with us today. It's a pleasure. And hi, everyone. Um, everything that I'm going to say is covered in this book, Inside the Box. It's about uh, systematic creativity that works inside the box rather than outside. And I see there is a question that someone asked about the slides. Jason, would you be kind enough to circulate the slides? To everyone later? OK. So um, creativity is considered to be something outside the box. It is considered to be something that uh, usually uh, involves some extraordinary events. And I want in 30 minutes to show you the opposite, that creativity can be systematic. It's not a, a talent. It's a skill. And may, perhaps surprisingly, it works inside rather than outside the box. Um, let me start with a puzzle. You have to find a spot on Earth that if you move a certain distance, say uh, 200 miles to the south, and then the same distance, 200 miles to the east, and then the same distance to the north, you end up exactly the same point. Let me draw one uh, possible journey, uh, and it ends up not in exactly the same point. Now, I cannot see you, but I can feel you. And I think that you already discovered at least some of you discovered the fact that it can be in the North Pole. And indeed, the North Pole is a, a good solution because any direction is the south. And therefore, if you go to the south and then to the east and then back to the north, you have to come back to exactly the same point. And uh, if I gave you enough time, I assume that most of you would probably solve this, uh, this puzzle. The point is that although this is a very unique, very interesting uh, uh, solution, and in fact, you can even ask what is the color of the bear that is walking there, and in the North Pole, there are only white bears. The fact is that there is an infinite number of solutions to this, uh, to this puzzle, usually ignored, uh, usually overlooked. And the reason is because we have implicit assumptions. We assume that on our way to the south, and on our way back to the north, we need to move on different meridians. This is an implicit assumption. What is wrong with implicit assumption? Well, most of implicit assumptions are wrong. Most of explicit assumptions are correct. And the reason is simple. If you have an assumption and it's explicit, you ask yourself, you test it, you ask your peers, you consult. This is in the stack. This is in the bid. Everything is known. But if this is an implicit assumption, it is not put into a test. And therefore, you may overlook an infinite number of solutions. What if I relax this assumption 
and I assume that I can go back on the same meridian. So it means that after I go 200 miles to the south, I have to circle Earth 200 miles in order to go back on the same meridian to the same point. Why this is an infinite number of solution? Because if you look at this circle, all the points on this circle satisfy this puzzle. And in fact, this is a high order infinite number because I can circle Earth twice, four times, or any integer number. So the reason I wanted to start with this puzzle is to show you that there are implicit assumptions and they clutter, they, they clutter our judgment. And therefore, there is an infinite number of solutions here in the south. It's not the South Pole, but it's here and we overlook them. Only one out of thousand people can find this infinite number of solutions. And the question is, can we improve this? Can we enhance our creativity to find so many ideas that are hidden? We call this also fixedness. But it's not the same. In implicit assumptions, we just, we just assume something, and therefore we direct our thought in the wrong direction. However, in fixedness, we just do what we were keep doing all the time. At any rate, the literature and also a lot of gurus and consultants, they are fascinated by the fixedness, and therefore, they invented the term. In order to defeat the fixedness, in order to defeat the implicit assumptions, we have to think outside the box. I'm going to show you that this is a myth. It doesn't work. And in fact, the problem with thinking outside the box is that usually it will drive your ideas to be less creative, and in fact, you have a fewer number of ideas if you think outside the box, if you use all these kind of methods of stimulation and, and brainstorming. I want to give an example, what does it mean to think inside a box, and a metaphor for everything that I'm going to show you today and uh, that is covered in the book and in these workshops. Um, what do you see? Of course, you cannot answer, but I bet that most of you can see here Einstein. Those of you who see someone else, you should uh, go to check up your eyes. Now, in order to see someone else, those of you who have glasses, please remove them like this. Or if you don't use glasses, then stand up and take a few steps back. And if your office is small, then you can do something a little more painful. You can just press your eyeball or blink very fast. And if you don't see Marilyn Monroe there, then uh, Jason is going to send you the slides and you just can rotate the paper or just take the paper away from you. And therefore, if you put yourself out Zoom, then you would see Marilyn Monroe. Can you see that? Awesome. Thanks, Rajiv and team. So um, why did I start with this? Two reasons. First, I want to metaphorically argue that inside every Einstein, there is a Marilyn Monroe. And we want to develop a kind of perspective outside the Zoom, if you will, in order to find, to uncover Marilyn Monroe, because that could be an interesting solution, maybe someone, uh, something that we overlook. There is another reason. This is a template of innovation, a template of creativity. Apparently, most of creative ideas in the world can be slotted into specific classes, specific archetypes, and we call them templates. Once you know these templates, you can project what would be the next idea of a system even before you receive signals that were sent by the market. This is one of the templates. It is called attribute dependency. And the template, in very briefly, is that you have two variables that are not connected, that are independent, and you create a dependency. In most picture, the visual is not a function of the distance. Here, if you stand up and you go back, you see a different visual. So this is an example for attribute dependency. By using these templates in a systematic way, you can develop creative ideas, the kind of ideas that usually you overlook. Let's go back a little bit for to the outside the box, sorry, to the outside the box uh, notion. I'm not going to bore you with uh, studies and papers, but all these papers are arguing consistently that there are a lot of findings, empirical findings, that thinking outside the box simply doesn't work. Just an example, the productivity loss in brainstorming. I don't have time here to make this argument clear, so I, I'm just I'm referring you to the literature, but there is a consistent finding that brainstorming, if you apply brainstorming, you make sure that the number of the ideas drops, and 
the originality also drops. And one reason why people think that brainstorming is so effective is because if you enter a brainstorming session and you compare what the group is doing and what you believe that you could do alone, then the group is superior. Of course they're superior. Ten people sometimes are better than one. But this is not the right comparison. The right comparison is taking uh, the ten individuals in a different group, putting them in different rooms, thinking alone, and then collect all the ideas. Apparently, the group of people that think alone, if you collect all the ideas, you will have more ideas with more variants, and they will be more creative than the same size of the group doing brainstorming. Now, this is not exactly outside-the-box thinking. Outside-the-box thinking came from here. Are you familiar with this nine dots puzzle? You have to connect all these nine dots with four lines without leaving the, the paper. And I'll give you the solution. The solution is like this. It's a nice solution. It's a symmetrical, it's uh, outside the box. And in fact, when Guilford first started his research on creativity, he used this puzzle. And what he noticed, and maybe you experienced this yourself, is that only 20% of the individuals are able to solve this puzzle. And he noticed something else. Everyone, including the 20 individuals, they start to push lines inside this box, somehow locked inside this imaginary square. He called this fixedness. And this solution he called outside the box. I'm going to argue something else. I'm going to argue that fixedness and creativity, they define each other. There are some sort of yin and yang. They cannot exist without the other. And we need the fixedness in order to define the creative idea. But this is assume, assumingly a very interesting case because only 20% solve it and everyone else has some fixedness inside the box. What Guilford didn't know and therefore wasn't able to publish is that there was another experiment in 69 reported only in 89 again where there was a control group when individuals were asked to solve the puzzle by using lines that were pushed outside the box. Can you guess how many solve this puzzle? Well, intelligent guess could be 90%, 80%, because now they have a hint. They know that they have to push the lines outside the box. But surprisingly enough, only 25% of the individuals correctly solve this puzzle. And there are many reasons for that, but basically it's a very strong case where there is a puzzle, where there is a box. And in order to solve it, you have to think and do something outside the box. And even there, the instruction to think outside the box doesn't work at all. I'll tell you a secret. In life, there are no boxes. And therefore, thinking outside the box is just a metaphor. By the way, there are other formulations for this uh, puzzle. For example, you can do it with three lines. You can assume that these dots have width, and therefore you can push lines close to infinity. Sorry, uh, it's very difficult with this mouse to draw lines, but imagine that I'm drawing a straight line here, like this. Of course, they're not straight. And there is also a puzzle with one line, like uh, Professor Boleslavsky, uh, the legendary one, who told me once that in order to connect three dots, you can connect any three dots with one line, provided that it's sufficiently thick. So you just draw a very thick line to include all these nine dots. But the four lines is the more interesting one because it has a fixedness. And as I said before, the fixedness defines the creativity. However, thinking outside the box doesn't help. Let me show you an example of the solution inside the box. And since I already argued that there isn't any box in real life, I'm going to replace the term box with something else that we will call closed world. The closed world is something closer to a box, but this is the system that we have, and I'm going to argue that the creative idea is a restructuring of the concepts. It's a novel combination of the concepts and resources inside this closed world, inside this, this box. This is a case of a battle, a famous battle between the Mongolian army that tried to invade India. Uh, the Mongolian army was smaller, five times smaller than the Indian army. And it consisted of light riders, like here. This picture was taken from uh, the Lord of the Rings, so these are not elephants, these are these monsters that they use there. But basically, these were armed elephants 
and they they are like the tanks back in in these times and there were warriors uh, there above the elephants and the strategy was the following the indian army the elephant just move and crush everything and then the infantry and the light riders come to finish the job the mongolian army were facing a defeat now what would be an outside the box solution the mongolian general could call the air force it's outside the box pity that air force didn't exist back then and therefore this is just a ridiculous solution but it is outside the box another option would be retreat except this is a traditional solution it's routine one of course the retreat is an option by the way for the mongolian army it wasn't an option but any army can decide that uh, retreat is an option what the mongolian uh, general did is the following he uh, put fire on the camels and had the camel running towards the elephant the elephant saw just a firewall moving towards them panicked turned around and ran crushing the entire indian army as a result the Mongolian army could come marching, actually riding after the elephants and finishing the elephant job. Why this is creative? Well, first, because it's inside rather than outside. It is this novel combination. It is the kind of solution of how could we think uh, about this kind of idea before. But also there is a unique feature here where the source of the problem, the elephant, became the resource, resource of the solution because now by this restructuring, the Mongolian general could use the elephant in order to get an advantage for his army. And this is what we call inside the box kind of solution. Of course, it's more difficult to find it. Of course, it's, you, you need to think, but of course also you need to train yourself in order to find these kind of, uh, of ideas. So let's try to understand what is the creative idea briefly. Um, what do you think? Is this going to be a successful product or not? Well, some say yes, some say no. Uh, usually my students uh, two-thirds think that, no, nah, this is too close to a glue and uh, it's, uh, no one needs it. But one-third says that we don't have necessarily to use uh, the analogy to the glue. And also, maybe we can redesign it, and maybe in, in hiking, and uh, there are some, maybe some elders that uh, have shaking hands and prefer it overnight. Anyway, there might, be, uh, there might be a market for this. But I believe that all of us agree that this cannot be a successful product. Both of them are original. But this is ridiculous. This is a bizarre idea. We have to be very careful with originality and usefulness constructs. So ideas have two dimensions, originality and usefulness. Originality is high here, but what about usefulness? Maybe I do need to cool noodles on the way to my mouth, but I wouldn't use a fan. And had I used a fan, I probably wouldn't attach it to the stock chopsticks. So the cost reduced the usefulness here. So, Creative ideas are high on usefulness and they are high on originality. If an idea is high on originality and low on usefulness like this, this is a bizarre idea. This is not a creative idea. It's high on originality, but it's not a creative idea. You have to be very careful. Sometimes you generate a creative idea, or sorry, generate an original idea, and you call it creative just because this is original. Oh no. Creative idea has to be high on both. In fact, there is a third dimension, less important, which is simplicity. Creative ideas are also simple. You just need to light fire, and that's it. It's not enough to be unique. You need to be also useful, and you need to do it in a reasonable cost and in a simple way. Let's look at... Um, there is a problem with the slides here, I'll manage. Um, let's look at uh, the term inside the box and understand inside the closed world kind of framework. You see these, uh, th this, this problem? They need to uh, put this thing, whatever is that, on the second floor, but they don't have a large enough lever, and therefore they use two, two caterpillars. 
Um, can you see these two guys here? They balance it. Very dangerous. Don't try it at home. Speaking of dangerous, can you see this guy here fixing the car? And this one? This is my favorite, in fact, because look how ingenious is this guy building this construction just in order to replace the lamp. Um, one of my students uh, uh, told me that he saw this uh, device and the track is actually moving from lamp to lamp. And this is the winner. They want to have their lunch in the shed. There is shed there across the street, in the, in the street. No, they're going to sit under the truck. So all these kind of ideas, there's something in common there. I think we can all agree that they're interesting, they're creative, but they're dangerous. Are these people stupid? Well, most of my students start with uh, telling me, yes, they're stupid because they don't value life, but slowly they uh, agree that maybe in this kind of uh, situation, they don't have a choice. Maybe if he doesn't climb to replace the lamp, then he loses the job. And this is maybe more dangerous to his family and a threat to their life more than just climbing this ladder. But at any rate, they are not stupid. Maybe they don't value safety and life. However, um, they are not more creative than us. The second, the polar opposite view is that they are so ingenious, more than us, we couldn't come up with these kind of ideas. The reason they were able to find these ideas is because they were operating in a scarcity of resources environment. There is a lot of research, including some of, uh, of our work, that shows that when you work under constraints and with scarcity of resources, then because people are resourceful, then they can come up with these resourceful ideas. They don't have to if they have resources. Now, I'm not going to argue that you have to develop these kind of ideas if you want to be creative. All I'm trying to convince you is that you have to put your mind inside some set of constraints in order to unleash your creativity. So constraints can free your mind. I'm going to briefly only uh, remind you the story about uh, Houston. We have the problem. If you remember, they, uh, the astronauts were caught in space because of uh, some, uh, it was a set of uh, problems and they had to connect the rectangle filter to the uh, circular one, otherwise uh, they would just kill themselves with the breathing all the CO2. And they were able to do it, but the interesting way was that the engineer said, we have to connect this rectangular filter to this one, the circular one, using nothing but that. And nothing but that was the, all the components that are in the space shuttle on the table. And they were able to do it because you can connect everything with duct tape, nylon, and uh, some, some tubes. Now, maybe now you think that we are talking here about improvisations only, and by thinking inside the closed world, we are going to develop all these kind, neat solutions to small problems and not revolutionizing. So let me take you back in time to one of the finest moments in sports, and, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the most revolutionized development in the entire sport, not only athletic, this is the phosphory flop. Jason, would you be kind enough to show them the, the movie and then I'll go back and explain what really happened there. Sure, here is, here's the movie. The 1968 Olympic Games proved to be a turning point in the history of the high jump event. Into the Mexico City Olympic Arena came not only a new name to the sport, but a new approach, which was to revolutionize the high jump event. Dick Fosbury from the United States demonstrated a new style of high jump, which some considered strange and awkward. It was a jump he had devised in the previous years, and one which unsettled his opponents. <coughs> While the crowd at first saw him as a novelty, his continued success at clearing the ever-increasing height soon made it apparent he was a serious contender. Valentin Gavrilov, from the Soviet Union, failed at his attempt of 2.22 meters, while Fosbury and his U.S. teammate, Edward Carruthers, cleared their way to a jump-off. The bar sat at 2.24. Carruthers failed. 
and Fosbury took his new style of high jump over the bar and into the history books. Fosbury had won his gold. Within a few years, the Fosbury flop had become the standard method of jumping in this great Olympic sport. Okay, so I hope you can hear me now. I saw that there were a few problems with the audio. Um, the Fosbury flop was uh, the most uh, used case in creativity research and uh, talks. In fact, if you attended a creativity conference a few years ago, you probably would hear about this case because everyone was using the straddle, which is jumping like this. From here, I cannot demonstrate with the straddle. But Fosbury invented a new technique, winning the gold by using the opposite way. So they turned it outside the box kind of uh, solution. Now, personally, I don't have any problem with outside the box term, as long as this is only a metaphor for creativity. But the true story, how Fosbury developed his, uh, his new technique, is not outside the box. It's inside the box, and I had the privilege to interview Fosbury, and I'll share the story with you, how he developed it. But before that, let me show you well, I can't, Jason, something is missing here, the, the chart. Never mind. Um, we uh, interviewed sports athletes uh, all over the world, and we'll send you the slides so you will see there is a bar chart where you see that they uh, graded all the revolutions in all kinds of sports, giving Fosbury the highest grade, which is five, and the other uh, revolutions were like uh, the Olympic movement, the, the synthetic track, the running shoes, there were three and below. So Fosbury is considered as the most, uh, the most successful and prominent revolution. Let me tell you the story. Fosbury was uh, great in scissors. Do you know how to jump scissors? I can demonstrate it here, but we, we don't have the, the, the time for this. You just move your legs like this. This is the scissors. Fosbury was the champion in a class and in school, and he was in the team. Then. They had to go to high school, and he wanted to stay the team, except they started to uh, practice the straddle, or the western roll. Can you see how brave is this guy? He's jumping into the mud here. And Fosbury wasn't good in that. The mattresses were not good enough, and he wasn't such a great athlete, after all. Uh, and his uh, results with the straddle were terrible. Facing the sad reality that he has to quit the team, Fosbury approaches to his uh, coach with a deal. As long as Fosbury can jump with the scissors above the average of the team, he stays in the team. Fosbury is interested only in the social value of being in the team. He's not interested in, in athletes at all. And being such a nice guy, I can testify for that. The, Fosbury was such a great guy, the uh, coach couldn't resist, and he kept him in the, in the team. On the way to the next tournament, Fosbury remembers that he touches the bar with his hip, and therefore he decided to raise a little bit the hip. Raising it a little bit, clearing a few millimeters, and uh, that's enough to set a new record for himself, staying above the average of the team, staying in the team. However, Fosbury understands that his days in the team are numbered, and therefore he's, he doesn't practice at all. On the way to the second tournament, the next one, he remembers what helped him and decided to try again to raise a little bit the hips. And he succeeded to improve his uh, own record. And he's not training at all because he knows that his days are numbered. And then for three years, Fosbury never trains. Fosbury only practicing in the tournament, raising the hips. And eventually, after three years, the coach in the high school is replaced and he doesn't understand what he see. He saw a guy jumping scissor, except instead of sitting, like here, he's lying horizontally in the air using scissors. Um, he, of course, is astonished, but he understands that this is a new technique, and then he starts to work with Fosbury in improving this technique, and eventually Fosbury, without training the three critical years in high school, became uh, the American champion, he won the medal. By the way, he never set the record. After Fosbury, uh, the athletes practiced this uh, technique, and then if you look at the world record, it's flying. Uh, Fosbury never thought outside the straddle box, as many creative, creativity researchers and uh, speakers argue. 
Fosbury was thinking inside the Caesar's box. If you ask Fosbury, he was jumping Caesar's all the time. And he is quite a modest guy. Therefore, he, he said to me that all he wanted to do is just stay in the game and he doesn't understand what was all the fuss. And this is a revolution, despite the fact that Fosbury always thought about Caesar's. Let's go back to uh, understand what is outside the box. And Jason, uh, I hope you can hear me. And can you stop it when I tell you? Because this is a long movie. I just want to show them uh, the the first uh, the first part. Can you show? Me? Jason, let me take it back. So later he he says that uh, these are prototypes, and you can uh, you can use it uh, later. You will develop it. So. This is amazing, right? Because he wanted to uh, improve the, the experience by removing glasses, but he replaced it with outside the box kind of concepts like uh, synchronizing the the eyes, the the muscles with uh, with the computer, with the video. It's uh, it's an maybe it's an interesting technological device, but I don't know that I doubt that there is a, even one consumer who would purchase this and let someone control the the this this eyes. Um, I noticed that few of you couldn't see the video, so what we're going to do, we're going to send you a link so you can see both the videos, both videos, and also you can visit uh, the web inside the box.com and you can uh, download more materials and you'll have also the slides. What I want to do in order to wrap up this uh, uh, webinar is to show you one case, how, in, how a real case, how it was implemented the inside the box uh, thinking in order to come up with the creative idea and then conclude. This is a famous product, maybe you're already familiar with that. This is the Noticeable, and it was developed by Procter & Gamble, by Febreze, and it was developed, the idea was developed, using these, uh, this approach of systematic creativity, systematic inventive thinking, and I'm going to briefly squeeze one day work into 30 seconds to explain to you how exactly they, they work. So, what is this product? Uh, basically, this is an electric freshener where you have a scent here, you have a small heater inside, and when you uh, connect it to the electricity, the heater warms up the scent, it evaporates in the room, and then you have jasmine scent all over the room. Uh, Febreze was new to this business, and they wanted to introduce it to, to the market, and they wanted to, the strategy was to do it with innovation in order to send a message to the competitors here and now, we are here, uh, beware of us. So th th this was a, a conscious decision that they want to have something creative because they were new in this market and they want to to, to introduce themselves to, to everyone. Uh, one, one of the advantages of creative idea is that there is a large word of mouth. People talk about the creative idea. So they used uh, with an instructor, a trained instructor, uh, the multiplication template. We already saw the attribute dependency one. This is the multiplication. In a multiplication template, you pick up one of the most essential components and you create a copy of it. So what is very essential here? Of course, the scent. So there is one bottle of scent, and according to multiplication, you have to add another bottle. In your mind, of course, you don't have to manufacture anything at the first stage. So now you have two bottles of scent. Now, logically, there is no reason why you should have two scent exactly the same. And in fact, according to multiplication, when you create a copy, you have also to introduce a change to the copy, and it has to be different from the original in one of the important traits. One of the most important traits here is the scent itself. So now we have two bottles. We have jasmine here, and we have, say, orange here, and this is the new configuration. Now, logic again, systematic thinking. If I heat them at the same time, then the orange and the jasmine evaporate in the room, so you have just a mixture of two scents. You don't need two bottles for that. You can do it with one bottle with a mixture. So it means you can deduce that you have to warm them up in different times. Say you heat up uh, the jasmine for five minutes, and then you heat the orange for five minutes more, and then you go back to the jasmine and five minutes to the orange. At this stage, the systematic uh, process ends, and now you have to be creative. Now you have to use all your creativity in order to understand what is the value of this structure, and can it fit some sort of uh, 
uh, segment. And I'm talking slow in order to let you digest it, and maybe some of you already reasoned out that there is a habituation trait to anyone. When we enter a room, we smell something. After five minutes, we smell nothing. And this is not because the scent vanished, it's just because we habituated to this. So if you heat up the just in five minutes, then you turn it off and you heat the orange for five minutes and then go back and forth, the consumers have constant smell for 24 hours. So the message here and the value is that you can smell for 24 hours the scent. Now, you know the famous line in marketing, perception is reality. It doesn't matter that the competitors also work 24 hours. As long that you cannot smell them, there is an advantage to this one, the noticeable. In uh, less than uh, half a year, they took over 20% of the market, which is a remarkable achievement. And one of the reasons Procter & Gamble argues is that this was so surprising. They surprised the consumers, they surprised the competitor, they even surprised their employees. And this is the value of creativity. Now, uh, our webinar is about to end. And if you noticed, I never said that creative idea is better than a routine and non-creative idea. And this is because sometimes you need creative ideas, sometimes not. Uh, when do you need the creative idea? Sometimes you want to surprise, like Procter & Gamble wanted to surprise your consumers, you want to surprise your employees. It's, it's important to uh, add energies, positive energies to the system, and creative ideas are good with that. Sometimes the routine simply doesn't work, like in the Mongolian army. Sometimes because you, or for Fosbury, the struggle, Sometimes, because you stick to the routines, you cannot increase your performance, you cannot uh, add value to your uh, system, and therefore you need to look for different ways, maybe they are uh, better, just because you didn't see them before. So this is another option. I want to show you a case where you start with the convention, and at a certain stage you have to stop. And if you don't know where to stop and when to stop, then maybe um, it's time to learn before you learn how to systematically create. You just have to learn how to stop the routines. Um, I know that some of you, you said that there is no uh, connection here. So I hope you can see here the car. There is a car in the lake. And I want to uh, take it up with this lever. They are doing pretty well, as you can see. Some of you maybe notice this dangerous angle here. And this is the result. OK, so we need a larger lever. As you can see, the larger lever, the green one, easily can take the car out. Encouraged by the success, they try to take out the previous lever, ending with this disaster. But they never learn. At a certain stage, you have to stop. And when you stop, sometimes you want to consider creative ideas. And now the question is, do you want to wait for luck or wait for an extraordinary event? Or you want to train yourself so you can uh, develop creative ideas? How we call it? We call it on demand. When there is a demand for a creative idea, you can sit down, put together a team, and systematically find the idea in an efficient way. So this was only 30 minutes about this ways, and I hope that uh, I sparked your attention. And uh, I would love to see you in various activities, in the workshops, uh, in the web pages, in further webinars. And I wish that you can bring a lot of value to your organization with creative ideas. Thank you very much. Jacob, thank you so much. And uh, I want to invite everyone to, I'm, I'm putting a link here to our LinkedIn group. Um, it was a really interesting presentation. I think sparks a lot of a lot of questions. We're uh, a little over on time, so I'd really like to invite people to go over to our LinkedIn group. And if you have questions or want to talk about uh, some of these issues further, um, go there and start a discussion. And we'll make sure with, you know we'll monitor that and we can we can respond to questions there. Um, we do thank you so much for being with us today, Jacob, and thank you to all of you, 200 really? plus who are in the room. Uh, from all over the world. We will send out a recording so you can access that. Um, particularly if you had some audio trouble in the middle uh, or something, you'll be able to watch the recording. And please, of course, reach out to us if you have questions. And of course, also visit our website. Um, Jacob, uh, 
Jacob's work and a lot of other great work uh, as part of this uh, marketing innovation program coming up in June and again in November. So again, we thank you and uh, we hope to see you at another one of our online webinars or of course at one of our programs either online or here in New York City. Thanks again, Jacob. Thanks to all of you. Take care.